I want to pose a question to you, uh, and I want you to think about it for a second before you give a, an answer. The question is, what would be harder? To take a stand for Christ, knowing that it would be the very last thing that you do. Knowing that with your final breath, you would be confessing Jesus as your Lord and Savior before you lose your life for that confession. Or, living a long 80, 90 year life relatively at peace uh, with your faith but walking faithfully with Christ day in and day out what would be harder what's more challenging kind of wrestled uh, with that question a little bit uh, this week as we're coming to the end now of the book of Ephesians especially in the last couple of verses of chapter 6 Paul is saying peace uh, be to the brothers in love with faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be with all who love our Lord Jesus Christ with love incorruptible. And it got me thinking, because we, we often ask those questions. Maybe your, your mind wanders to questions like that. You know, if I were to have to make that kind of decision, would I stand for Christ knowing that it would be my very last thing? Could, could I do that? Could I make that decision? And, and we, we look at people like uh, some of our, our brothers and sisters in Christ who lost their lives uh, in, the, in the past years in Egypt on a beach. And we, we look at people like Rachel Scott uh, who went down as a, a, a young girl, a teenager who uh, took a stand for Christ in her school and lost her life as a result of that. We, could I do something like that? And I was wrestling through this question and just kind of wrestling back and forth. And I, I have to be honest with you. I, I'm really not so sure that personally I could say with confidence which would be harder. Taking that stand or just living faithfully with Christ day in and day out for a whole lifetime. Both of them require a great deal of faith. Uh, Both of them require faithfulness to Christ. Both of them uh, require dying to self. One in in more of a a big moment of taking that stand. Others in small daily decisions and moments of life, dying to self for the sake of Christ. I don't know which would be more challenging. We like to think maybe one or the other, but I think at the end of the day, what, what this stuff boils down to as Paul is addressed through this entire book of Ephesians is really a a, a deep and convicted understanding of who we are in Christ. I mean, to take that stand, right? To to think, wow, how hard would it be to take that stand for Christ, knowing it's the the very last thing that I would do, you know, giving up on all the the what-ifs and the hopes and dreams of the future to say, man, is Christ really worth dying for? You got to know who you are in Christ, But then on the other side, to take each and every day and the small mundane moments of life and say, I am willing to die to myself today also requires having a good perspective of who we are in Christ. To say, I I am not of this world. I am of Christ. I belong to him. I am set free from sin. I am now redeemed and alive and made new in Christ and and it's going to affect the way that I'm going to live my life today. Both require the same amount of dying to self. In all of them, we have to understand who we are. And I love how Paul has done that throughout this entire book. He has addressed that, who are you in Christ? And he starts with that. While so much of Ephesians has been really practical and like, okay, well, here's how your faith impacts your marriage and here's how your faith impacts your your work and all these different things. He starts with that question, who are you in Christ? Who are you in Christ as a child of God? Who are you in Christ? What do you have in Christ? And and starting with that, because when you deal with that first, it's going to impact the way that you go about being who you are. It's going to affect the way we live our life. Now, when we do the opposite, and we just want to take, well, how do I live out my Christian life? Or how do I just be a good person? We minimize Christianity to something hardly more than just moralism. Just go ahead and how do I be a good person? And Paul's like, that's not the emphasis here. That's not the defining feature of being a Christian. It's not just being a good person. It's being a follower of Jesus Christ, a child of God. It's knowing exactly who we are in Christ. Our identity in him is so incredibly important. Now, we live in a world right now that is struggling with that. Well, who, who are we struggling with the, the issue of identity and who am I in Christ? And, and the world's asking the question is, is our identity a sexuality issue? 
Is our identity a race issue? Is it a political issue? Is our identity a, a culture or tradition or, or that kind of issue that, that defines who I am? And our nation, frankly, our friends and our families, our young people as a nation are struggling with an identity crisis. And the church is stuck in the middle of it. And not always in, in bright, shining, beaming hope. Sometimes the church we're finding is struggling with the same exact things. We have become witnesses to more and more churches and more and more Christians who have been caving to the empty philosophies of the world. And I, I don't want to bash on that, but I, I come back to it and I, I just have to wonder if the reason we're seeing some of those things happen is because we've lost sight or some have lost sight of who we are in Christ and who we are called to be in Christ. That's what Paul has been talking about this whole book. Who are you? Who are you to be in Christ? How do we walk worthy of who we are called to be in Christ? So I'm sure there's a lot better uh, summarizing statements out there, but if we were to summarize the book of Ephesians in, in one statement answering the question, who am I in Christ? We might say that in Christ, I am chosen as a child of the King equipped and empowered to conform to Christ's character and his calling in my life. And if that's true, if we are chosen as a child of the king, equipped and empowered to conform to Christ's character and calling in my life, how do I remain faithful to that? How do I remain faithful to the very end? Let's look at our passage this morning in Ephesians chapter 6. We're going to be picking up in verse 18. We, we mentioned a little bit uh, the first half of verse 18 last week with uh, this spiritual battle. And that's what Paul's been talking about here in chapter 6, this battle that we are facing as uh, Christians where we, there's a war raging for your affections and your, your worship and your life. And it's a, not a war against flesh and blood. It's a, it's a spiritual battle and we need to be outfitted and equipped with God's armor, God's total armor to be effective in that battle. And he ended it by saying, pray. Pray at all times in the Spirit with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. And also for me, that words may be given to me in opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains, that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak." So that you also may know how I am and what I am doing, Tychicus, the beloved brother and faithful minister in the Lord, will tell you everything. I've sent him to you for this very purpose, that you may know how we are and that he may encourage your hearts. Peace be to the brothers and love with faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be with all who love our Lord Jesus Christ with love incorruptible. I think it's important for us to remember this context as we deal with 18 and 19 and 20 here as we jump into this and ask this question, how do I remain faithful to who I am in Christ? We can't forget that Paul's dealing with the spiritual battles. As if, uh, his concluding thoughts in the book of Ephesians, okay, here's who you are in Christ. Here's how we live in Christ. But it's going to be hard in the process. There's going to be days where we do well. There's going to be days where we struggle. We may uh, succeed in some days. And we may stumble and fall in others. But there is a battle that's raging. And part of this battle is prayer. And prayer is not just a putting on of another piece of armor, but it's a, it's a vital part of equipping the armor altogether. That if we neglect prayer, what strength do we have in each of these things? And so at the very end, he spends most of his time here uh, talking about prayer specifically. Because it's so vital, so important for our life and walk with Christ. Now, uh, to give a, a picture of this here, of the strength that prayer has um, in, in a battle, a more modern battle, because in Paul's day with the Romans, they probably didn't have a whole lot of air support. Uh, but in the modern context, air support is such a, it, it plays a vital role in a time of war, right? And so uh, oftentimes uh, you'll find uh, that soldiers in the heat of battle may call for air support if they need help outgunning an enemy. Maybe it's uh, calling down air support to destroy strongholds that they're, they're fighting against or, or uh, places where the enemy is just really combating them. They need some help defending 
defeating that enemy. And so they may call in uh, firepower to come and help out in the time of battle. Other times, air support may come in delivering supplies or ammunition to strengthen soldiers in the fight. Air support has become such a vital part of warfare today. And for the believer, prayer is often like radioing back to base, requesting air support. That sometimes in our spiritual battle that we are facing, that Paul is talking about, we need air support in terms of guns in the fight. And so we uh, radio back to God in prayer and say, Lord, I need, I need some air support to defeat these strongholds and these schemes that the devil is en- en- enlisting in an attack against myself or an attack against our church or in his, these strongholds in our nation or the world that we're living in. And we pray against strongholds in our nation. We pray against strongholds in our own hearts. We pray against strongholds in the hearts and lives of our family members. We pray against the strongholds and schemes of the devil in our communities. And we're calling in God's air support, recognizing that on our own, we are, we are outdone by our enemy. We need God in the battle. Other times, we request air support, if you will, in the spiritual battle that we face, asking God to supply the needs of the saints in the fight. That in the spirit, as Paul says, God would provide all that is necessary for strength and power in the fight. That we might stand firm. That God would give wisdom. That he would give discernment. That God would even give creativity and patience and understanding and grace and mercy. All that we need to be effective and stand firm in the spiritual battle that we face. And because of the vital role that air support has come to play, uh, there are terms that have been put to it that NATO and other organizations like that use, terms like air parity and air superiority and air supremacy to define the strength of a force's air support. Air parity is used when both forces are pretty equally matched in, the air, in their strength in the air. Uh, that neither side held, holds any sort of control in the skies, but uh, there's just not enough strength. There's insufficient strength to sway the battle one way or another. Air superiority, on the other hand, is when one side has a force so significantly dominant over the other that they are allowing their other land and sea and air forces to execute their, their plans without prohibited inter- interference from their enemy. They are strong in the sky. It's a good place to be, to have air superiority. But the best position uh, that, that forces strive for is the, the position of air supremacy. When you have total control over the skies, that the enemy has not an ounce of strength in the air to combat any of the plans and schemes that your side has going on. And I share these things because when it comes to prayer, oftentimes it seems what we strive for is a level of air parity. Where maybe we have we pray for enough strength to just hold the defensive line, to cover where, where our bases are at. But I wonder if we should be praying with an effort for air supremacy, a desire to have control over the airfield, say, Lord, we need you in everything. That apart from you, what are we? So as uh, Paul writes earlier in chapter 3, that we might be strengthened with power through his spirit in our inner being. What's your prayer life like? What are you praying towards? Parity? Superiority or supremacy? So Paul, as he addresses this idea of prayer, he, he speaks of its importance and its significance for us. He, he says, man, as we do this, if we were to kind of characterize uh, the prayers Paul brings, we might say that, that we should have prayer that's consistent and prayer that is courageous. Notice in verse 18, consistent, he says, pray at all times in the Spirit. What he's not meaning here is that just whenever you do happen to pray, pray in the Spirit. I mean, we should do that. It's not that we pray uh, to other gods or other spirits, but we pray in the Spirit of God to God. Uh, But what Paul is conveying is that in all seasons of opportunity, you should pray. Now, to kind of give a picture of this because when Paul's uh, conveying here is that these seasons are fixed and there's there's a prime opportunity for this prayer to take now for the example that we might be dealing with today is uh, here and now in May believe it or not we're in May already we are in prime planting season 
okay? Which, Kevin, you're, you're living this life, and some of our other guys are, are living this life right now, that it's planting season, which means this is the prime time to get seeds in the ground so the plants may grow up to maturity and be ready to harvest before winter hits. And so what farmers are doing is when the weather's nice, they take every opportunity to get the seeds in the ground. They don't waste the time. They don't waste the sunny days. They make every opportunity to do that. And that's what Paul is calling us to, that when the opportunity is ripe, don't waste your opportunity to pray. At all times, in all seasons of opportunity, pray in the Spirit. Seize those opportunities. And he says we are to do it with all prayer and supplication. And to that end, later in verse 18, he says, keep alert. Keep alert. This brings us back that he's not done just talking about this this spiritual battle that we are facing, that in the battle we are to keep alert at all times uh, with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. In other words, never let your guard down. Never let your guard down. Keep alert. I don't know about you, but I struggle with that sometimes. Sometimes I let my guard down. Sometimes I neglect to be devoted with all perseverance praying for the saints. The reality is Paul is saying, listen, we we are in the midst of a battle and we don't know when the attack or how the attack may come. So always keep on alert. Always be in prayer. Seize every opportunity. Literally, this, this concept of being alert conveyed this, this wartime effort as somebody is always watching. I love it. We uh, talk in our, uh, with the other campus pastors, and they, they talk about how at some of their campuses they have people who are praying all the way through their service. A prayer team that, like, as the church gathers the entire time, they have people who have committed themselves to prayer. How cool is that? Keep alert at all times, with all perseverance, making supplication for the saints. So we are to do this not just with, you'll notice in verse 18, there's just some perseverance, but with all perseverance. There is a consistency that Paul speaks to in our prayers. Consistency in the opportunity and consistency in our fervency in prayer. If you look elsewhere, Colossians 4.23, Paul says, continue steadfastly in prayer, being watchful in it with thanksgiving. 1 Thessalonians 5, pray without ceasing. Now this is one of those things that frankly we do an awfully good job talking about in church, don't we? Prayer is so important. Prayer is so vital in our relationship with Christ and our walk with Christ. We should be praying for one another. We should be praying for the church. We should be praying for a community that's great. And the reality is that most of us are going to go home today and this week we're going to pray no more and no more intensely than we did last week. For some reason, putting this into practice seems to sometimes be a challenge for us. I wonder... I wonder if the reason is because we're in a battle. What is it for you? What's, what's the reason in your life that sometimes you find it hard to be persistent in your prayer? You're just so busy? You got enough going on, you get caught up in the moment, and, and next thing you know, the day is over, and you're like, gosh, man, I really wanted to spend some more time praying today, just as I went through the other day, but I got so caught up distractions what if we were to say that prayer is a discipline that should be developed in our life so I think if we were to sit down and have a conversation with each and every one of us we would all say yeah I could really grow in my prayer life then we beat ourselves up over struggling in that but I don't know if we need to develop it over time If I were to say that tomorrow our whole church was going to go run a marathon, how would you feel? Who who would be ready to run a marathon tomorrow? Okay, all right. A couple of you guys. So you guys can run a marathon tomorrow, and we will all watch and see what's, how that goes. The rest of us recognize, yeah, I'm probably not in shape to run a marathon tomorrow. Could I be in shape to run a marathon in a year? 
I don't think I could be, uh, but maybe some of you could run a marathon in a year. If you had the proper time to train and prepare yourself for it, recognize that it takes weeks and months, and for people like me, years to prepare to run a marathon. Because it demands looking at all of our life. And it's not just the activity that we're doing, because we've got to recognize that preparing for a marathon is more than just taking a, a light jog in the morning and the evening on a daily basis. Preparing for a marathon takes a great deal of planning, it takes a great deal of preparation. It, it requires looking at your rest, it looks at your diet, it looks at uh, what you are doing, and you're setting aside the appropriate time to train. It, it's, it's a commitment to prepare for a marathon. And it's not something that happens overnight. And so I wonder, as we look at our prayer lives and we recognize that Paul's saying, listen, we ought to keep alert with all perseverance in our prayer. We say, okay, well, I'm going to go run a marathon tomorrow. And then we wonder why we are huffing and puffing and, and falling short of the finish line when it comes to, to a marathon of prayer. And we, maybe we need to develop it. Maybe we need to prepare for that and take little steps. What if preparing for it might, uh, might look like tomorrow at lunch you set aside a couple minutes to devote to prayer? That is, you're, you're starving and you're so ready to eat. You say, okay, before I uh, satisfy the needs of my hunger, I'm going to stop and go before the Lord, recognizing that man does not live on bread alone. What if it looked like setting a couple of alarms for yourself throughout the day to remind yourself to pray for somebody, to remind yourself to pray about something, and when that alarm goes off, you're like... I need to take a moment to pray. And you develop that discipline. What if it means waking up 15 minutes earlier just to set aside some time with the Lord before you jump into the busyness of your day? I wonder if praying with all perseverance and keeping alert in this might involve a little bit more planning, a little bit more intentionality, a little more preparation. That we don't say it's not where I want to get to, Let's take steps to get there. Let's take steps to, to pray in the Spirit in the way that we are praying for our brothers and sisters in Christ. We're praying for our church. We're praying intentionally about our community. Let's work towards that. Prayer is to be consistent, Paul is talking about, but he also uh, speaks to us praying courageously. You notice what Paul asks for prayer, and he says, uh, pray for all the saints, and he says, pray also for me. And it's so interesting. I, I, I'm always blown away by this because Paul says, would you pray that words might be given to me in opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel for which I'm an ambassador in chains, that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak. Now, I don't know about you, but when I think of the Apostle Paul, I don't think of a guy who needs extra boldness and confidence to proclaim the gospel. I'm like, you seem to have that down pretty good. Now, maybe myself, I, I'd love some prayer for that. Love, but the Apostle Paul seems pretty strong in that area. And he's like, no, this is where I need prayer. And he says right here that he's, uh, he's in chains uh, as an ambassador for this message. You might expect Paul to say, would you guys pray that, that I would be released from prison? That I would have freedom to go about doing uh, what I was doing and taking the God. It's just where I am. Pray that I might have boldness to proclaim the gospel that I might speak as I ought to speak, that words would be given to me. What a courageous prayer. And that would be a, a very courageous prayer for some of you. Maybe for you to pray that prayer for yourself, your heart starts beating just a little bit faster. Your blood pressure rises just a little bit. Some of you, are, you thrive on evangelism. You're like, I can't, just give me the opportunity. I'm jumping at it. And pray that you would have words to speak, that you would have boldness. But here you've got Paul, I, and I love it because it's just real life in prison for this. And you gotta wonder, like I, I was thinking through, I'm like, why would Paul ask for prayer for this? I'm like, okay, if I were in Paul's shoes and I, it seemed like every time I opened my mouth and shared the gospel, I ended up beaten or thrown in prison. The next time I go to open my mouth to share the gospel, I might think twice. I know what's about to happen. If I talk about Jesus right now, I'm getting locked up. So would you just pray that I'd be bold? Even though I know what the consequence might be, even though I know what might come of this, that I would have the boldness to speak because I am an ambassador for this. And we're quick to say, well, yeah, that makes sense. Paul's an apostle. 
Paul was, Paul was an ambassador for the gospel. That's not me, though. I just live in Waterman. Who am I? You are an ambassador. I love it. Uh, first, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. All this, Paul says, is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. God making his appeal through us. You know what that means? We are ambassadors for Christ. God making his appeal through us. So might we learn to pray courageously, Lord, would you give me boldness to speak as I ought to speak? Would you give me words to share when those opportunities come up? Recognizing that for some of us, that's a very, very courageous prayer. Because we know that in those kinds of prayers, God's going to answer. He's going to give you an opportunity, and you're going to be like, oh, I prayed about that this morning, and now here's the opportunity that God gave me. Will I be bold? Will he give me that boldness, or will I shrink away from the opportunity? Would you pray that for somebody else? Would you pray that for the people who are in your small group? Lord, give them boldness. Give them the words to share them. When the opportunity comes, we would speak as your ambassadors in the manner in which we should speak confidently because guess what? We're just the messengers. There's a great freedom in that, that it's not your message. It's not your wit. It's not your creativity. It's God's message. We are given the opportunity and the privilege to be spokesmen. So take his message and we get to share it boldly. So we got to learn to pray consistently. we got to learn to pray courageously and be bold in our prayers. What would boldness in our prayers look like for our church? What would boldness in our prayers look like in your workplace? What would being courageous in our prayers look like for you as an individual, in our community, in our nation? Let's learn to be bold and courageous as we go before the throne because we know who it is we're talking to. We're not just talking to somebody else. We're talking to the Creator God, to God Almighty, the one who is seated above all rulers and dominions and powers and authorities, the one who has conquered death itself, the one whose word spoke this world and all of its beings into existence. The one who by the word of his might upholds the entire universe. That's who we're speaking to. So to pray a little courageously, what can God not do? What would we not ask God to do? What strongholds would we not pray against? What schemes of our enemy would we not bring before the throne of God? Let's not neglect this great privilege that we have in prayer. And the other beautiful thing about this is as Paul uh, talks about it, it reminds us that prayer is a great way to partner with each other. It's a great way to partner with each other. We, we're reminded of this partnership that Paul has with, uh, between him and the Ephesian church. As we remember Paul spent years in this place uh, sharing the gospel with them, leading the, the first Ephesian Christians to the Lord. He established a church here. He trained up men. Uh, he planted this church. Years of time blood, sweat, tears, conversations, laboring and prayer, all this now see a church thriving in the city. It's a beautiful thing. And he's, he's coming, we're reminded in, in verse 19 here that it's not just Paul ministering to them. They have an opportunity to minister to Paul. It's like, would you pray for me? He's asking for their partnership in ministry and what's going on. And these partnerships that we have in ministry and faith are so vital to our faithfulness to the end that as we surround ourselves with brothers and sisters in Christ, we need these things. I was, as a matter of fact, I would go so far as to say that you're up a creek without a paddle if you don't have genuine, strong partnerships in ministry and the gospel. 
We were created and designed as believers to live in this unity. As Paul said, we are fellow citizens. We are each in Christ members of the household of God. We are family in Christ. And to isolate ourselves as Christians is contrary to the identity that we have in Christ, that collectively we are the bride of Christ. Us. Not just you. Not just me. Us. And so it sounds awfully ridiculous to say that we love God, but that we can go it without his people. We love God, but we're fine to do it on our own. And I understand that to a degree I'm preaching to the choir because you're here. What an opportunity to call other people into the fellowship of the gospel. And I've got to be honest with you, this is one of those areas that I, I, I wonder if we've become so casual about this in the church. Josh was talking about our uh, small group uh, study in Ephesians wrapping up and having some time off. And this summer, we're going to kick off a whole other series talking about discipleship and, and following Christ. And what an opportunity to just engage in this and say, listen, to walk the Christian life, it's not just about doing a Bible study. It's about meeting with other believers, sharing life with other believers, talking with other believers, celebrating with other believers, mourning with other believers, hurting with other believers, that we are doing life together in this. That we're not just trying to go it alone. See, we don't do small groups just to say, hey, let's uh, carve out another night of your night and give you one more thing to commit to and another study and more things to learn and read and do. That's not the heart of small groups. The heart of small groups is discipleship following Jesus and it's us doing it together coming alongside putting our arm around one another and saying let's encourage each other in Christ so who's partnered with you in ministry who would you point to and say man when it comes to living out my faith they are my partners in ministry Paul, when he speaks of uh, these partnerships, now oftentimes what we'll do when we come to uh, these headings, like at least in the ESV, right before verse 21, it says final greetings. Anybody else have something like that in your Bible? A lot of times what we do is we're like, great, I'm done with the book. And we hardly read those. because There's not a lot of teaching. There's not a lot going on, but, but they're still insightful. So as you look at uh, verses 21 and following, we see just a bit of an insight into this partnership that Paul has with the church. And we might characterize these partnerships as missional and meaningful. Missional in the sense that this church was born out of the mission. This church was built on the mission of the gospel. And this church had bought into the mission of the gospel. They had partnered with Paul in all of it. And so uh, Paul's request even itself, would you, would you pray that I'd be bold in the mission? Th th these are people who are partnered together. Paul and this church partnered in missional ways. That it's not just some casual get together and throw hot dogs on the grill, but it's like, no, let's, let's be intentional about going forth with this mission. That we have a job to do. There is work to be done. Let's, let's partner in that. Let's pray for each other in that. And so Paul tells him he's sending his buddy Tychicus a wonderful opportunity I'm going to send you to go to this, these people and just let them know everything that's going on and so he goes and not only are their, their, their partnership missional but it's meaningful in the sense that it's deeper than just the surface it's, it's more than just talking about oh, isn't it a nice day today oh, what you got going on this week you know, it, it, it cuts a little bit deeper he's going to tell you everything that's going on he's going to tell you how I am. He's going to tell you what I'm doing. He's going to tell you everything. Verse 21. Verse 22. I have sent him for this purpose that you may know how we are and that we may encourage your hearts. So I wonder who your partners in ministry are. And think critically on that. Because I know for myself, I'm quick to look at who are my partners in ministry, and, I, and I'll just be quick to kind of try to justify somebody as a partner because I like hanging out with them. Well, I hang out with this person a lot, so they must be my partner in ministry. But do we ever talk about ministry? Do they have any earthly idea what the Lord's doing in my life? Have we wrestled through stuff together? Am I informing them? Have I let them know everything? Am I, is my life an open book before them? Am I encouraging them? Are they encouraging me, or are we praying for one another? 
Who's really your partner in ministry? Do you find yourself engaged in ministry? Who are the people who are praying for you along the way? Who are the people that you're praying for along the way? The beautiful thing is that prayer is a great way to do this. And so I was just kind of convicted on this, and I want to share my conviction with you a little bit this week because maybe it's something we could all run with. For starters, many of us are up here right now, but downstairs there's a great ministry going on for kids. There are kids learning about the scriptures, learning about God, having fun together, playing crafts, doing all these things. And and while many of us don't find ourselves downstairs, do you ever find yourself praying for that ministry? Many of us don't have the opportunity to come on here on Sunday afternoons with the youth groups all hanging out. Are you partnering with that ministry? Do you know what's going on with the youth group? Do you know what's going on, what these, what these awesome young people are dealing with in their life? Do you know the struggles and the trials and the issues that they're facing? Are you praying for the youth group? Do you ever consider coming and helping out and serving? Villages, uh, we are one campus of many. Do you ever take time to pray for the other campuses of Village Bible Church? Sugar Grove, Plano, Naperville, Aurora, El Camino. Praying for their health, praying for their mission, for their leadership, for their members, for all the ministries that they have going on. What about the other churches in our area? Do you ever pray for them? For the fruitfulness of their ministry, for the health of their church? Do you lift them up in prayer? Do you pray for their pastors? Do you pray for their leaders? Do you pray for their, the different ministries that they have going on? There's so many opportunities that we have to just partner in prayer, to be missional and have meaningful understanding of what's going on and what God's doing in our area. So have some personal partners in ministry. And then consider the people that you may partner with otherwise. What about missionaries in Papua New Guinea and Alaska and Uganda and Poland and all over the world? Do you pray for them? We can totally do that. There is nothing that stops us from partnering with these people, our brothers and sisters in Christ, in the power of prayer. That's what Paul is calling this church to. What an opportunity that we have to step up to the plate and to partner with others missionally and meaningfully in the gospel. Paul has spent a lot of time in this book addressing who we are. We've spent 17 weeks, believe it or not, studying the book of Ephesians. That's a lot of time for a short book. And I want to commend you guys that you guys have come along for the ride. You've spent 17 weeks diving into this book sitting in it, wrestling with it, being challenged by it, being encouraged by it, week in and week out, looking to God's word as we unpack this. And we've learned some valuable things of who we are. We've learned some valuable things of the unity that we should strive for in the church. We've been challenged in the way that we live out our faith. There's so much that we've covered, and I I hope that as we've gone through this, that it's been a blessing to you, that God has enriched your faith in the process that he's blessed you in the process as we've just gone before him and said, Lord, what does your word have to say? What does it have to say about me? What does it have to say about us? What What is it calling me to? And submitting ourselves before it. So I just want to encourage you as we close this book that we go as children of the king, equipped and empowered to conform to Christ's character and to conform to the calling that he has called us to as his people. Amen?